Okay, guys. When we, before we get started, each of you, let's just say who you are and who you work for, and then we'll start talking about science fiction. Okay. Hello. My name is Amber Case. Uh, I study cyborg anthropology. And feedback. And feedback as well. Um, and uh, I'm working on a project called GeoLoki, which is a, a location sharing platform. I am Bradford Cross, and I previously did a startup called Flightcaster, which was just acquired, and now I have a new one called Woven, which is secret. Uh, and I'm Toby Sager, and uh, I, worked for, I work for Google. I was working for a company called MetaWeb, uh, which was uh, merging public, huge public data sets, and we were acquired by Google uh, in July. So um, one of the reasons we wanted to have this discussion is because it's easy for us to get stuck in the middle of the big data and computation and algorithms without taking our heads up a level and looking at the impact of all this stuff on society. Um, and so I've asked these folks here mostly because they have interesting views on where this is going to take us uh, culturally, psychologically. Um, what do you guys, how dependent do you think we're going to get on data telling us how to lead our lives? I think uh, extremely dependent. I mean, when you think about data has the capability, when you have enough of it, to reduce the time and space it takes for people to get something done, um, then it's just going to become, if people don't have data, very like a very long time for them to do something that they would have done if they had access to data. So I think it's going to become, uh, you know, not only convenient but the thing to do um, when you have a large you know, data set that helps you do something that you wouldn't have been able to do before. Um, so I think we'll definitely get into fancier augmented reality kinds of things before too long, but even now, um, I think all of us have certain things that we suck at. For me, I suck really bad at spelling and I suck really bad at directions, and fortunately for me, both of those problems have been solved, uh, so now I'm a happier man. Uh, actually, I, I think we're already really dependent on data for everything we do, and uh, the, our next challenge is going to be figuring out what to ignore, um, because uh, I, I can't see more and more data being any more useful to me at this point, um, unless, uh, well, unless I come up with better filtering mechanisms or better, uh, better mechanisms to, to make it all coherent. Well, it, but it does seem like um, we used to go to the web to ask it a question, and now the web, we kind of turn on our computer and it tells us what to do that day, right? And in Bradford's case, it might be, you know, what you need to get, where you need to go and what you need to get done and what you've misspelled. But um, ultimately, we're going to stop asking questions and wait for those questions to be posed of us, right? Um, is that going to lead us to Nicholas Carr's view of the shallows where all we do is spend our time just tasting the data a little bit and moving on? Um, I think that... Uh well, <laughs> I think that the people who are like easily distracted by, by Twitter or whatever, what's happening right now, um, it's not clear that they were the deep thinkers before and they've been pulled <laughs> away from that. <laughs> I don't know what they were doing before, but um, I don't know, maybe watching mice run around or something. <laughs> yeah, I think there'll be a bunch of people in the deep end or they'll be very, 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 very into a small thing very, you know, intensely. Um, and then, you know, there'll be a large uh, portion of the population that just, you know, consumes the channels that they're interested in consuming, which is, as you said, not very different from how it's always been. Um, so it'll just make those people in those deeper channels have an easier time of, of doing something that they would have been doing before. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll learn a lot about ourselves and um, we'll use that knowledge to build new kinds of systems Right now, really, we only have search, so it's kind of like you're saying, it's still in the search era of the web where we're looking for stuff. Um, over time, you know, we'll have more systems that do more for us, and that will help a lot with these kinds of problems. But right now, we don't have a lot of those yet that are uh, running in production and people are using on a day-to-day -day basis, but I don't think those are too far away, probably only like under five years away. So someone yesterday asked me what the difference is between just a data warehouse and big data. Um, and one of the things that we discussed was this idea that uh, with a data warehouse or a traditional enterprise data store, you're, you're putting a priori knowledge in there. You know that you're putting in quarterly sales figures, for example. And with big data, we kind of hoard things and don't know uh, what we're going to use it for. So we don't necessarily have uh, foreknowledge of how it's going to be useful. We have faith that that data will be good, and we throw the data in there. Um, that suggests you should store everything. Is that a good idea? Amber's nodding happily. 
I think it's a good idea because, you know, right now we're, we're really interested in real-time web, but I think it's going to be more about, you know, what people are doing in the future. So um, if you have a data store and then you go into the future, you know, in, in two years or something, you'll know that, that something of that data set is really useful and then you can make, you know, predictive behavior based on that and help a lot of people in, in that system who have, you know, given their data to that system. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think what we've found a lot is that... Um, what people say about themselves is actually a lot less useful than what they do. Um, people's identity and their behavior are often like quite distinct, and if you want to predict what they're going to do next, it's actually better to look at their past behavior than what they say about themselves. So collecting sort of the data exhaust of what's going on um, is, is actually more useful for analytics than sort of the, 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 uh, the state of things. So let me, let me ask you an ethical question. Let's say um, we've, we've captured all of our data, and then someone wants to, um, someone gets sued for divorce, um, and their spouse says, well, you were cheating on me. It's a civil case, so innocent until proven guilty doesn't apply. Uh, and the, the uh, opposition basically subpoenas the records and says, where were you on this night? Now, if that person wants to philander, they're going to have to, you know, if they're recording everything with their GPS and their camera and so on, they're going to have to hire someone who looks like them pay them not to talk and not to look into mirrors so they can get away for a tryst for a night. Otherwise, they're going to be guilty because there's a recording of them doing whatever that is. And the absence of a recording implies guilt. I mean, that's a pretty big change for society if we all record all our actions. How do you think law is going to catch up with that? Do you think we're, it's going to take us a while as a society to, get, to catch up with that expectation? Yeah, well, that's not new. I mean, it's been happening already. Like, for example... Um, you know, a, a current one is, is in journalism with all, the, with all the fair use issues and like what's an excerpt and where's the great, you know, and, and we're kind of waiting for, for cases to define, you know, and there's a lot of things that have to be redefined. So that, that's not really new. I think you're right that the problem will get worse, but it's just something we have to deal with as society. Yeah, this has happened before. Somebody committed a crime, but they didn't bring their cell phone with them for the three days that they were off committing the crime. And so they said, hey, uh, you're all, everybody knows that you bring your phone everywhere, but during these days, you, you didn't, so you committed the crime. In that, you know, in that case, it was actually helpful to society. Um, but in some cases, you know, people are going to get hurt. Um, but I think it's the same ratio of people who are getting hurt because of, of you know, how the system works today will get hurt in the future. <laughs> that was awesome. Apparently, you win that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best kind of censorship I've ever seen. Just redact that part by playing music on top of it. Um, that was my ringtone, actually. <laughs> so tell me a little about uh, how this is going to change government. I mean, we're, we're speculating a lot here, but it really seems to me like representative democracy is a hack that we couldn't afford to send everyone um, to Washington or Ottawa or wherever. And Clay yesterday was pointing out that, uh, you know, we have a much greater ratio of citizens to representatives than we used to, uh, so we no longer have that direct representation. Can we actually get to the point of a digital democracy if everybody's connected and we're all tracking this information and so on? Uh, a, a few years ago, like around 20 years ago, um, this guy, Steve Mann, who created a bunch of wearable computing, he created this thing that he called Seussvalence, which was the opposite of surveillance, where everybody had a digital device and they could track everything. And, and it did make it better. I mean, um, you know, people who could record their own situations. You know, we see this happening in other countries where they say, you know, I got beat up and here's the video. So I, I think that that's really, that, that could be very helpful um, if they have the ability to spread that um, to places that can actually defend them. So I think that that's useful, you know, the, the surveillance type thing, the opposite of, of this, you know, top-down surveillance sort of society. Toby, you said that um, people's behaviors are more, more honest, if you will, than and their past behaviors than, than their stated intents. Uh, I heard someone much smarter than I say, we're never as honest as we are in our search bar. Um, given where you work, um, people who are seeing what people do, where they surf, what they do, uh, are clearly armed with a lot of information on behavioral stuff. Um, how, did that, how does get, that get put to, to good use, and how does that data that they're creating, how do, how do I own that data? What can I do about controlling that data that's out there? Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure I can speak to that. <laughs> um, I think that... Um, hmm. How can you put it to good use? Well, that, behavior, that behavioral data that you've got, if you're doing a search, for example, um, 
the search engine knows that, my browser knows that, and so on. Um, do you see like personal versions of the kinds of analytics that big search providers can do, uh, helping people in that way? And, and do you see there being congressional legislation or things like that around giving you back control of the data that third parties have? You know, I really, I, I really have no idea <laughs> about uh, how the how the government's going to deal with uh, all these issues. Um, I, I, uh, to your previous point about uh, direct democracy, I, I don't know if you know, we have that in California, and um, people have very, very mixed opinions about how successful it is. Uh, so, I'm not sure that um, that like you know our current government's going to just go and embrace that as a system. Um, to get around this hack of, democ of democracy, of uh, representative democracy. What are, you, what are you most worried about as far as our adoption of big data and technology as part of our lives? Um, I mean, I think it's what you said, what you talked about earlier, about the expectation that you'll be recording everything, so why didn't you? Um, I mean, you're already carrying your phone everywhere, right? And uh, and so the, the, that scenario you described, it could, it could actually happen to you. You could be like, well, we can ask the phone, you can let us ask the phone company where you were. And, uh, and so I guess that's, that's definitely a, a potential fear. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't know how it'll play out, though. It's, I don't know if you look like you have something to say. <laughs> There's a lot of people who they have the Safeway cards or the King Supers cards, and, and you talk to them about it, and they say, okay, well, I'm going to buy this in this batch, and then I'm going to buy this on this card so that nobody knows that I got, like, toilet paper in this other object that I don't want on my record. And in reality, there, you know, the data that's being taken there is mostly for, you know, the usefulness of the store. It's like, well, you know, most of these people are buying toilet paper here, and now we can stock, you know, X amount of toilet paper and X amount of grapes. It's not that, oh, look, Bill got this and this. Oh, my gosh, let's laugh at him. It's, it's this, you know, anonymized data sort of thing, where it's slightly anonymized. They know that this guy has this zip code, and he's buying this stuff, and he lives nearby, and therefore the, the store can reduce prices for everybody because they know what's, what's getting purchased. So in a way, even, you know, if... Uh, people are contributing data to a large system and that data is getting crunched somehow and you know that there's going to be a flu epidemic or something like that because people are searching for flu, you know, symptoms and things like that. And it's not necessarily tied to somebody's personal profile. It's still really useful data. And, you know, it, it's, it's not that, you know, somebody's saying, oh, here, I'm going to narrow way down into you. Just, just, you know, just having that data there in mass, you know, and having duplicate accounts of that data, you know, is indicative of, of you know, trends, and you can actually watch that and, and help people out better. So I, I think that a lot of people don't really realize that, especially when they have, you know, safety cards in, in these, like, small situations. Um, and if they did, they'd realize that it was really helpful to them and, and not really harming them per personally. So you sound like an advocate for, yes, please record more, and well, good things will happen. Yes, if, if it's taken care of and not on the personal level. If it's, if it's slightly anonymized in a way that you know, protects people's interests, then yes. Um, not, not all you know, full blast data with, with everybody's you know, personal information. Like. But we're, I mean, we're clearly sitting here talking about technologies that allow us to get down to the individual and parse you know, using natural language stuff to extract data. The, the AOL search debacle in, in 2006, where they released data and within six days, journalists had figured out who a woman was, was actually worse because the stuff she was searching for was all these medical conditions. And when they went and talked to her, it turns out she was the most with it person in her home, and she was searching on behalf of the other people who had all the ailments. So a machine would have concluded she was a horrible insurance risk. Right, exactly. But the thing is, that data in mass not being attached to that person was useful because it means that there are people in society that have those symptoms. Not necessarily one person with all those symptoms, but that those symptoms exist in a certain number of people. And therefore, you know, that can be reported and, and you know, if that amount of symptoms exist, then, then people can start taking care of it or they can see an opportunity to, to help it. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a, a case that, that, you know, that suffered because it was all tied to one person instead of just kind of anonymized and, and put into a batch. And that's not a new problem. The Census Bureau has always had to deal with, like, what level do we release the data at, right? So is it the block, or is that too easy to identify people's incomes if you went over there and met them or whatever? So, um, so you know, they've, they've been doing this for 100 years of, like, how, how deep, how, how individual can, can any data point be? So, uh, you know, 10 years ago, we all, or maybe more than 10, we all started using the web. Um, and 
five years ago, we all started getting touchscreen devices that were positional and had cameras and so on. Um, I think we're all surprised how quickly we get to the next technology that unlocks these things. What do you guys think is the next thing that's going to unlock um, you know, this big data, ubiquitous computing world we're going into, the, the Facebook or the iPhone of the next five years? Not that that's a big question or anything. But, you know. I know you want to say brain implants. <laughs> um, not brain implants. <laughs> uh, probably uh, location-based data that you know, knows not where you are, but where you're going. That becomes kind of a remote control for reality, where the interface is no longer this solid thing, but you know, you're walking into a mailbox, you're getting data pushed to you just in time. Um, you know, that you walk around. Just the things that were created, you know, at MIT and Park like 30 years ago, uh, that stuff that cost $500,000 is now mature enough to exist in everybody's pockets. So I think that's, you know, a, a logical next step as to where things are going. You can go back in time and just read the papers and replace everything with, you know, Facebook instead of identity and virtual reality. And they hold up very well. Bradford? Um, I would say, I would say it's a mix of what's happened on the internet so far connected with what's happening on mobile now. So, you know, on the web we have all this massive amount of data on, from interactions that people have had. And so, like I mentioned earlier, I think we'll start to learn a huge amount about ourselves as individuals from that. And then on phones, we have obviously a huge amount of data about where we go and other things that we do. And so when you connect all this information about you uh, that's on the server, with you going around with your mobile, both capturing data from that and also pushing things to that. I think there's gonna be a, a huge amount of really neat stuff that happens there because it's, it's like you can have a, a personal uh, learner as a, as a server or, or, or as, a, as an agent or servant to you that's like on some server somewhere. And then you can just create all kinds of neat stuff. So I think there'll be a huge amount of that. In the next, and that's not far away. Like, this isn't crazy futuristic shit. This is like, you know, now. So. Yeah, um, actually, to that point, uh, I I've tried, tried some experiments with this. I actually took my social network and plotted all my phone records and um, SMS and email records onto it so I could see how much I was contacting everyone. and, and uh, I realized this was actually pretty cool because you can see, oh, this is this whole social group over here that I haven't had any contact with in two months. And uh, I think that, you know, as people are generating personal data from all these different sources, the integration and, um, and sort of uh, the integration of your personal data in this way, you know, just for yourself to look at, not for, to blend with anyone else's or anything like that, um, will sort of help you make life decisions that, that uh, maybe you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Really interesting conversation.